Lord, we do look to you, and, and most especially we look to you today, and we, we thank you. Lord, as we think of the cross, we think of Christ and his suffering for us. Lord, we, we marvel at the magnitude of such love. Lord, we, we are, are bowed down before you, acknowledging the great sacrifice, the suffering, the agony that you bore, that we may be saved. Lord, we thank you that you gave your body to be broken, that you poured out your blood, and we might be forgiven. And Lord, we want to lift you up this morning as we we do remember your sacrifice. We pray that we will reverence you as we ought, that we will take this time very seriously. And Lord, that our hearts will be stirred in love and praise to you. And Lord, I pray as well for Diane this morning as she grieves, Lord, and as that family grieves together. Father, I pray that you will You'll make that time together a time of of comfort and and help to them that they may truly encourage and strengthen each other, Lord, that you will, uh, Lord, give Diane opportunities and and wisdom and and sharing the truths of your word, Lord, that she may minister comfort to her family during this time. Father, for the services and the viewing, Lord, is a, I know it's a lot going on here in the next couple of days. I pray that your peace will reign. Lord, that you will give, again, Diane, but each of them, that peace that passes all understanding. I pray that the gospel will be preached. Lord, that that hope of eternal life will be the hope that comforts their heart. Lord, if any in that family is not saved, I pray that you will use this time to draw them to you. And Lord, in the days to come, I pray for the grandkids, for Oliver and Gabriel, Lord, that you will comfort them, especially as they deal with the death of their mom. Lord, that they may that they may run to you and find in you the hope and the peace that they need. And Lord, for each of the family members that you will comfort them richly. And Lord, we are also so grateful for how you've been working in Tirukave. Lord, what a, a privilege it is to partner with the child, to to see you blessing their ministry, see these souls saved. We rejoice in that and pray that you'll continue that great work. And pray that you'll do that work here in Manistique, that we may see souls saved through the work of this ministry. But Lord, I pray for the the childs in the church there, that you will bless them as they prepare for the childs to return to the States, or that all will go smoothly. I pray for Tom as he prepares to to lead that ministry for a time, that you'll give him peace, give him wisdom and grace. Lord, use this in his life as a strengthening and a training time that he may may grow in you. And Lord, that there, while the childs are here, Lord, that that church will continue to flourish. And so we lift that up to you, asking for your blessing. And Lord, we ask again for your blessing on our time today as we again consider our Savior, as we delve into your word. Lord, that you, your Holy Spirit will teach us. Father, that we may, we may worship you, giving you the glory that you deserve. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to a book that we don't often turn to. It's the third book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. And some have complained that the Bible is a bloody book. And it is. The Mosaic Law has dozens of references to the use of blood in the sacrifices. The New Testament speaks dozens of times about the blood of Jesus. And some have blamed the church for spending too much time talking about blood. Others have responded by not talking about blood. There are even some hymnals that have taken out songs like we just sang, nothing but the blood, and there's power in the blood, and there's a fountain filled with blood, and are you washed in the blood, and when I see the blood, and we can go on, there are many songs in our hymnals, and some have skipped them, or ignored them, and even removed them. And yet the blood and the sacrifices were not just random brutality. They were a constant reminder of the wages of sin. 
They were a continual reminder of God's promise to forgive our sin. And we find as we go through the Old Testament that God, in fact, paid a lot of attention to blood. In Genesis 9, God told Noah that they could now eat meat. Up to that point, it seems that God had not given men permission to eat meat. But after the flood, God gave explicit permission to mankind that they now could eat meat. However, in Genesis 9, verse 4, God also gave an explicit prohibition. He said, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall ye not eat. So in other words, God's allowing man to eat meat, but he forbids them to eat bloody meat. Now, this is not a prohibition against raw steaks. Rather, it's a, it's a prohibition about, against eating meat that has not been properly drained. And that same prohibition was repeated in the Mosaic Law. The Israelites were forbidden to eat any meat that had not been properly drained of its blood. Interestingly, in Acts chapter 15, the church in Jerusalem advised the Gentile churches to observe the same restriction, to not eat, to not eat blood. But we go to scriptures and we find that God is not forbidding the eating of blood for health reasons. God told Noah why he was forbidding the eating of blood. He said, the life of the flesh is in the blood. God says, our life is in our blood. And we know this to be true, as our blood transfers oxygen and nutrients to every cell in our body, so that as a result, we are, we are forbidden to eat the blood or the life of another creature. Now look now at Leviticus 17 and verse 11. He says the same thing, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Verse 14, God again says, For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. He is saying, repeatedly saying, the life of the flesh, the life of creatures, is tied up in the blood. But God also explicitly says in Leviticus seventeen eleven that he has given the blood as an atonement for sin. So that, in effect, the life of the animal was placed on the altar, it was even placed on the priest, and on the mercy seat, all as a covering for sin. So with that in mind, turn to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20. This blood was a constant reminder that the life was forfeited. That the sinner, because of his sin, deserves death. And the only possible atonement for sin is a payment for that sin that is equal to or greater than the penalty of the sin. So when God said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, the only payment, the only atonement is death. And so since sin forfeits the life, so life must be given to pay the penalty of sin. And God in his grace allowed the blood of the animal, the life of an animal, to be a temporary substitute for the sinner to cover the sin until a better sacrifice was provided. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 20, Moses is sprinkled the the blood upon the, the law and the different instruments of the tabernacle and the worship. And he says, This is the blood of the covenant, the testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into holy place every year with the blood of others. 
For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There's so much in these few verses. But first and foremost, it is teaching that blood is necessary for the forgiveness of sin. If there is no blood, there is no forgiveness. I know that over the years, some have tried to downplay the blood of Jesus. Not just those who are opposed to it, but those faithful Christians have said that what matters most is the death of Jesus. And, And others have said the blood doesn't matter at all. Hebrews says we cannot do without the blood of Jesus. So those who would speak of the death of Jesus on the cross without reference to his blood, are ignoring that most vital component for forgiveness. God has given the blood. That's what he said in Leviticus 17. He gave the blood as an atonement. Here he says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus' death is important. Jesus could not just donate blood and forgive our sin because the wages of sin is death. But Jesus could not die a bloodless death. He could not have been, for example, hung from the neck. Because it is the blood that is necessary for the forgiveness. So that Jesus had to shed his blood. It is that blood sacrifice that forgives our sin. And we are forgiven of sin when we then plunge ourselves into that cleansing blood. And the blood of Jesus that's poured out in his death is necessary because justice demands punishment equal to the gravity of the crime. We all know this is how it works in our justice system. You get a a fine for speeding and you go to prison for a long time for vehicular manslaughter. Because we know that speeding is not as severe as killing someone with your car. So there's different consequences. Sin is the greatest crime in the universe. And don't think I said that as, as hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating for effect. I mean that. Sin is the greatest crime in the universe. Because sin is an offense against and a rebellion, a rebellion against the holy God who is our creator And our sustainer, the God who is perfect in all of his ways. And we have have gone to him and essentially said, I don't want you. You made me. You made me for your glory, but I don't want anything to do with it. I'm going to live however I want. And sin, as this incredible offense against the infinitely holy God, demands, therefore, the greatest possible punishment. That is why the wages of sin is death. But it's not just physical death. The wages of sin is eternal death. Separation from God forever. Because in our sin, we have offended the eternally holy God. And in the Old Testament, God gave this blood of an animal sacrifice as a covering for sin. But we all know an animal is not equal to a man. We recognize this. You talk about murder. It would not be a just punishment simply to exact a very large fine or for a murderer to give a, give the, the, the victim's family a really nice bull. The best livestock he could find. We recognize that no matter how great the the, the bull may be, its value is not that of a human life. We recognize no matter how large the fine may be, money, in all in in whatever extent of it, does not is not as great as the value of a human life. The Old Testament, God has provided this animal sacrifice. But it can only be a temporary covering because it it, it is a gracious means by which God has provided for Israel to approach him and come to him. And it's a picture of the sacrifice that's to come, but it could never take away sin because the wages of sin is the death of the sinner. 
And, and a sheep just isn't going to cut it. And so the sacrifice, the value of that sacrifice has to be at least as great as the value of a human. God, in his grace and mercy, promised, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, promised to send one who would deliver men from sin. And that one is Jesus. And the sacrifice that takes away our sin is his death on the cross. And so when it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, he is driving, driving our minds back to that cross. We, we know what happened on that day. Jesus was arrested. He was beaten, mocked, and scourged. He was then taken to Golgotha, where he was nailed to a cross. His arms were, were stretched wide across a large wooden beam. Large spikes were driven through each of his wrists. And then his feet were crossed on top of each other, and another spike was, was driven through his foot, fastening him to the cross. The cross was then stood upright, dropped into a hole, and Jesus was suspended from those three nails. And then he began the long torture of the cross that slowly suffocated him. And at the end of six hours on the cross, Jesus died. He did not die of suffocation. He did not die of his wounds. The scripture tells us he gave up the ghost. He willingly released his life. A Roman soldier, wanting to make sure of Jesus' death, drove a spear through Jesus' side up into his heart. And John tells us that when the spear was removed, that out of that wound flowed a mixture of blood and of water. And Jesus died. He shed his blood as a sacrifice for our sin. And Jesus is a sacrifice far more valuable than you or I. Because Jesus is God the Son. The only begotten Son of God, the creator and ruler of everything. He is perfect, sinless, blameless, spotless in all ways. And his death is enough to wash away all sin forever. Skip down to verse 26. He says that now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus died one time. He made one sacrifice for sin. And this is the most significant contrast between the Old Testament sacrifices and the sacrifice of Jesus. Because the Old Testament sacrifices never stopped. Hundreds of thousands of sacrifices. 1,500 years of sacrifices. The priest constantly going to the altars, making yet another sacrifice every single year, going back into the day of atonement, into the, the Holy of Holies to make atonement for sin over and over and over again. And before that, Since the creation of the world, we see hints that every godly man offered sacrifice. That Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and others offered sacrifices. Countless animals slain to cover sin. And yet not one of them or all of them combined was enough to take away the sin of even one sinner. And then Jesus came. And he offered one sacrifice. And that one sacrifice is sufficient to take away all the sin of all men. So that whoever believes him, whoever trusts him, finds that their sin is washed away. That blood that he shed, it dripped down his face from the crown of thorns. That blood that ran down his back from the scourging. That blood that blossomed on his cheeks when the, his beard was plucked out. The blood that flowed from his wrist and his ankles. That blood that ran down the cross from that wound in his side. That river of blood is enough to wash away all your sin. And to understand the magnitude of the blood of Christ, we have to understand the magnitude of our sin. And I can't. I cannot count the magnitude of my sin. I have committed hundreds of thousands of sins over the course of my life. 
all that I did before I say I was saved was corrupted and filthy before God. And since my salvation, I'm sure that I have not failed to sin every single day of my life. Not just once a day, but many times a day. I have sinned in action, sinned in thought, sinned in speech, sinned in desire, sinned in emotion. I, I may sin less now than I once did. I may hate my sin more now than I once did, but I find that my entire life is an unbroken stream of filth. And yet that black river that flows out of my flesh is plunged into the blood of Christ and it springs up again clean as a crystal clear river, righteous in the eyes of God because the blood of Jesus has washed away all my sin. All of it. Every sin I will ever commit Every sin I have ever committed, every sin I recognize, every sin that I committed without even realizing it, every sin of of intention and every sin of omission, it is all gone by the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is sufficient no matter what the sin. The blood of Jesus was able to wash away David's adultery, Solomon's idolatry, Peter's betrayal, Paul's murder, and all of Adam's rebellion. It's all washed away. And the blood of Jesus is able to wash away all your sin. All of it. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, your sin is gone. No matter what you've done. The blood of Jesus washes it all away. All of your sin. All of mine. And it is even more effective than that because the blood of Jesus is able to wash away all of the sin of all who believe Him. There will never be a point in time where someone goes to Christ and they find that the blood is not able to cleanse them. That there's some spot left behind. The last person to trust Jesus for salvation will be just as fully saved as the first person was. Even though the blood of Jesus has washed countless sinners clean, it is just as effective and able to cleanse today as it ever was. His one offering is enough to wash away all of the sin of all who believe Him forever. There's no more sacrifice needed. We do not have an altar here where we bring in sheep and goats because we don't need one. We do not make sacrifices of our income for our salvation. We do not make sacrifices of our time for our salvation. We do not make sacrifices of ourselves for our salvation. It is done. The sacrifice Christ made is sufficient. There's no more needed. And this truth profoundly shapes how we understand communion. Because we are gathered here today to celebrate this Lord's Supper together, but it is not at all a re-sacrificing of Jesus. In communion, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We do not in any way sacrifice him so that he is not physically or spiritually present in the elements. We do not in any way crush his body or drink his blood. We do not by this service add to his suffering in the least. We commemorate memorialize and symbolize his death. We do not repeat his sacrifice. We remember it because his one sacrifice was sufficient for all sins. So we do not need this to be saved. We are saved by Christ. In this passage here in verse 25 and 26, it tells us that if Jesus needed to be offered multiple times, then for men to be saved, he would have had to been offered from the very 
beginning of the world. If the one sacrifice was not enough, it would have had to been a sacrifice over and over again. Adam and Eve would have had to been sacrificed Jesus to be saved. Jesus would have been, had to been sacrificed for Abel to be saved and then sacrificed again for Seth to be saved and then again for Enoch to be saved and then again for Methuselah to be saved and then again for Noah to be saved and on and on and on again. He would have had to been sacrificed over and over and over again, but Jesus' one sacrifice is enough. On that cross, he probably did not lose more than a couple quarts of blood. But that two quarts is an infinite ocean into which our sin is plunged and buried forever. And as a result, we have no more sin. Verse 26, it says that he appeared to put away sin. What a statement. Our sin is put away. It is abolished. It is ended. It is gone. It is separated from us. And God will never again see us as guilty. That He instead, when we trust Jesus for our salvation, God declares us righteous. We are justified. Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are past. Here we see in a couple of verses there all these great truths of salvation that our forgiveness and our justification are interwoven together, that we are made clean by The blood of Jesus. That through faith in Him and the effective power of His death in His blood, we are forgiven. And we are made righteous. This blood of Jesus washes away our sin. Makes us righteous before God. All of it has been accomplished by Him. And it is in communion that we remember The blood of Jesus. We remember that this blood of Jesus is the seal of God's covenant to us. Back in verse 20, Moses says, This is the blood of the testament which God hath made with you. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper that evening before his crucifixion, he gave the cup to his disciples and he told them, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sin. The blood of Jesus is the blood of God's covenant. It secures to us this new covenant. And the blood of Jesus is the blood of His testament. It secures to us all the blessings of God's promises. And so as we take the cup, and we, we take this cup and we, we, we see it, We think on it and we drink of it. It is reminding us of the blood of Jesus that was poured out for our sin. When we pour out this cup, we remember His blood that was poured out for us. By taking part in this blood, this bread and in this cup, we are confessing several important truths. In communion... We confess that we are sinners who needed a Savior. We are acknowledging that we are not sufficient of ourselves to save ourselves, but that we needed another to take our sin from us. And we are remembering that Jesus is the Savior who sacrificed Himself for our salvation. In communion, we are confessing that we have received Jesus And we are declaring that we must receive Jesus for our sin to be washed away. Communion is an evangelistic event because we show that Christ must be received to save. In John chapter 6, Jesus speaks of himself as bread and drink, which must be received. We know that Jesus is not saying that he becomes actual food and drink. 
He is most certainly not saying that his flesh and blood must be literally eaten and drunk. Rather, Jesus is telling how we receive him. We know it's a simple illustration because when someone eats and drinks, they receive the food into themselves. The food and drink does no good while it's outside the person. It may look nice on the plate. It may have many great things said about it, but it does no good until it is taken within. And Jesus does no good for you until you receive Him. He does not become your Savior until you take Him within. You may hear great preaching about Jesus. You may read the Bible about Jesus, but that does not save. You may pray and have fond thoughts about Jesus, but that does not save. What you must do is apply his death to your own sin and receive him into your hearts. And so listen to what Jesus says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. So what Jesus is saying simply is we must receive him. The life of the flesh is in the blood. We must receive the blood of Jesus to give us life. In communion, you're showing your reception of Jesus as Savior. You are confessing by taking these elements that you have first taken Christ. So first and foremost, if you have not received Jesus, I invite you to do so. I invite you to do so today. But if you've not received him, I also ask you, don't take communion. Don't deceive us by telling us you are saved if you're not. Communion is a serious time. We go to the God, to the the book of 1 Corinthians, and we find a serious warning against taking communion improperly. But 1 Corinthians 11 is not the first time that Paul mentions communion in that book. He's already mentioned it several times, and each time it gives us a little bit more information about what it means to eat and drink unworthily. 1 Corinthians says that if you're not right, in a right relationship with your fellow believers... If you're at odds with them or acting selfishly towards them, do not take communion. First Corinthians says that if you're living in sin, do not take communion. First Corinthians says that those who are practicing idolatry have no place at the Lord's table. If you are practicing idolatry, do not take communion. Now, I don't mean that if if you're bowing down to a little idol you have hidden in your closet, because I don't think any of us have those. We certainly have idols. The kind of idolatry that we worship today is that in which we live our lives as if something is more important than God. So that if you regularly skip your time with God, your time in the Word, your time in prayer, your time in church, because you are doing something else, then there's a very good chance that thing has become an idol. If you are willing to sin to get something, You have made that thing an idol. If you're willing to sin because you don't get something, you have made that thing an idol. If you are practicing in your life anything that makes something else more important to you than God, that something else has become an idol. So I warn you, do not take communion if you're practicing idolatry. 1 Corinthians warns us to not take communion if you're treating this like just some other meal. This is not a light snack at the end of the service. This is a serious memorial. It is not intended to satisfy your physical hunger and thirst. It is given as a time to remember him who satisfies all your needs. So if you're treating this as anything less than a memorial of Jesus... Start changing your thinking right now. Remember him who died for you. Think deeply about who Jesus is and what he has done for your salvation. Treat this time like a memorial service 
for a deceased loved one. That's exactly what it is. We are remembering the one who loved us most and who we love most. And the reason we're given all of these warnings, the reason why I put this note at the end of this message is because there were some in Corinth who were taking communion very lightly and they fell under the chastening of the Lord. Some were sick and some had died because they disregarded the Lord's Supper. This is a serious time. Do not take this carelessly, selfishly, sinfully, or apathetically. Now, having said all of that, I don't want to scare you away from this observance. I really don't. I want you to understand the significance, but I do not mean that you have to be perfect to take communion. Otherwise, none of us would take it. I mean you need to be taking sin seriously. You may have sinned this morning. You can still take communion. The question is not, have you sinned? The question is, have you been forgiven of your sin? If you have received Jesus as your Savior, you have a seat at the Lord's table. 